I'm doing the next section here. I, I'm, I deliberately try to not make it too technical. Loads of videos, um, nice sound, so we'll see. Does the laptop work for starters? Well, there's Windows sounds anyway. Um, so this is a talk I've given a couple of times. I gave it over in London um, and uh, I've given it in Dublin before. And it's about a project I've been doing for about the last three or four years. It's about amateur radio satellites, is the, is the description of the talk, and receiving live video from the orbiting space station. So there's the TOG logo. I'm also a member of uh, South Dublin Radio Club, and uh, that's our logo there on the right. And the last time I gave the talk was with this uh, astronomy group. So I'll start off with a video. So this video was taken from the space station. It's been quite edited and it shows the view from the space station at night time. So this is sped up a bit quicker than the space station really moves, but you can see the storms there. You can see the street lights. I, I can't recognize which country this is, but sometimes you can pick out specific countries at night time. You can see the solar panels are adjusting there to line up to catch the sun. As the space station is always moving, it has to adjust the solar panels to catch the sun. You can see the sun rising just there. You can see the aurora if you're up there in the North Pole, or there's a similar one on the South Pole. So that's just an introduction to the space station. And um, there's my contact details if you want to know more about the project. And um, I'll say I'm a member of Southam Radio Club, a member of TOG as well. And my other slides were changed to Science Week, but um, that's Space Week. So I'll explain a little bit about orbits. So we were, we were talking earlier about launching satellites. So most of the smaller satellites are in low Earth orbit. So it's that purple line and they travel around the world and they're moving constantly and you can see as the space station there is moving constantly and that will affect what I'm doing later on which is trying to receive signals from it. There's, there's a thing there called polar orbit. So the polar orbit is interesting in the fact that it goes over the north pole each time and it goes over the south pole each time and one of the benefits of doing that is the earth is rotating all the time and because the earth is rotating all the time but it's rotating around the north and south pole. So if you go over the north and south pole, what you'll do is you'll go from north to south on a map over and over and over again. And if you do the, the position right, you'll actually pass over every point on Earth. So for example, if you want a spy satellite to film every part of the Earth, you might put it in a polar orbit, but also you'll want it in a polar orbit, but you'll also want daylight over where you're doing it. So what they call it a sun synchronous polar orbit. So you put your satellite maybe over the north and south pole, you put a spy camera on it, and you'll make sure it goes over the same point at midday every day. And it'll be midday at that point in the world every time you go over that point. And so, for example, you might get a new photo at midday of Dub every day of Dublin, and at midday in London, and midday in France, and midday in Germany. And then the, the more interesting, simple, 
thing is to look at what's changed. Is there any new buildings? Is there anything changed? And if you take it at midday every day, you know you've probably got good sun. Um, so some of the spy satellites will be in polar orbit. Also a lot of the smaller weather satellites will be in polar orbit. Because say for example if you wanted to pass over Europe every day, well if you put it in a polar orbit you can guarantee you can design it so it passes over Europe all the time and you, if for European weather forecasts. So there's a high elliptical orbit which I will kind of skip and then there's geostationary orbit. So geostationary orbit is you're way out and you're flying around and you're doing one orbit per day and you're flying around the equator. And from the, the Earth is spinning, but from the point of view of the satellite's moving, but from the point of view of a person on the ground, the satellite looks like it's not moving at all. So the problem I have is I'm trying to pick up something that's lower to orbit, so I need to keep moving where I point. But if it's in geostationary orbit, you never need to move to point at it. And the great thing about that is if you're on the ground, you're trying to get a signal from the geostationary satellite, you point your antenna at the satellite and you never need to adjust it again. And the most common one people would use is Sky TV. So Sky TV has to be in geostationary orbit. Otherwise you have to go out and keep adjusting your sky dish as the satellite kept moving around the place the whole time. So Sky is in geostationary orbit and most TV satellites that we use are in geostationary orbit. But one of the problems is they're very, very far away. So at the start the signal from Sky was actually quite weak. Um, so anyway, I'll go on with my next little bit. The space station, as we're saying, is, is not constantly above the same location. It keeps moving. So one site, website you can use to see where the space station is now, and more importantly, see when it's going to pass over Dublin or over Ireland, is heavens above. It's quite easy to do. You put in where you are, and it'll tell you when the space station is going to pass. One of the interesting things about, about um, heavens above, it'll tell you when it's dark where you are, and it's sunlight where the space station is, which is normally about an hour after darkness here, you might be able to see the space station with the naked eye. So if you look at heavens above, sometimes you can see the space, when the space station is going to be visible. And if it happens to be a clear night, and I think it's a clear night tonight because it's so cold, um, you'll actually be able to see the space station for a couple of minutes, usually pass over from the west to the east, usually kind of south of Dublin. Normally the highest uh, north it goes is Cork, but you can see it from Dublin, um, passing over Cork. So I'll move on to my video too, if I can um, find the right place. I, no, that's not it. The, I, I, this slide, heavily prepared. Oh, which one is it? Oh, there we go. So this gives an example of the orbit of the space station sped up. And I'll see does it work. So I'm trying to pick up a, a, a picture of the sp a, a signal from the space station. So the space station is the red dot. The amount of the ground you can see is the white circle. And the red line is just its general orbit. So you can see there in America, sometimes it's passing over America quite good. Other times it's not. Sometimes it's passing over Australia. But the next time around it mightn't pass over Australia. So what we're looking to try to do is get a picture in Ireland. So you can see sometimes it doesn't pass over Ireland and sometimes it does. So again, I use the website Heavens Above or other sites to predict when it's going to pass over Ireland so I can get um, TV pictures from the space station. So, uh, back to me slideshow. So, this is an exaggerated uh, image of the satellites around the world. So, they're much bigger than they are in reality, but there's loads of little satellites doing different things. Now, some of them might be space junk, uh, some of them are working satellites, some of them are secret, some of them are different countries. But there's loads of little satellites for doing different things. A lot of them are in different orbits, they don't crash into each other. There's so much uh, space up there anyway, um, it's quite unlikely they'll crash into each other. And most of the satellites in lower Earth orbit will come back to Earth within about 20 years. So even if they're up there and they're broke, within about 20 years they'll crash into the sea somewhere. So I'll skip over this a little bit, but um, we use radio frequencies. So the radio frequencies we're using for sending the TV pictures are up near where the satellite signals are broadcasting. So if there's something in the way, you won't get the signal. And the main problem we have is that the Earth is in the way. So um, these are some examples of amateur satellites. We were talking earlier about CubeSats. So the one at the top left, some of you might recognize it as Sputnik. And Sputnik wasn't really an amateur satellite. It was built by the Russians. But they actually broadcast on an amateur frequency, which meant anyone with the right radio could hear them. And it deliberately announced 
what it was broadcasting. And the reason they did that was to prove they were the first one in the world to put a satellite into space. So that satellite, while it was an amateur satellite, was actually um, broadcasting on amateur frequencies with the intention that amateurs would pick it up. Then the bottom right is a larger type amateur satellite. You can see there's solar panels on some of it. And then often they have cameras and antennas and different things for different projects. So some satellites look down at the Earth. And then some satellites look back at space as well, looking at planets and things like that, or maybe looking at the sun. So my main talk is about the space station. So what is the space station? A lot of people don't know. It's not just NASA. It's the Russians. It's the Japanese. It's the Canadians. And the European Space Agency. So it travels about 7 kilometers a second. Um, it goes about 20, 27,600 kilometers an hour. It's not that high up. They were talk we were talking earlier on about the orbits of CubeSats. It's only 400 kilometers above the ground, which means it's only about two or 300 miles up. And that's why you can see it quite easily when it goes over Cork. It was launched in November 20, 1998. It may end in uh, 2025, depending on budgets and um, what lunatics in charge. And uh, it costs 150 billion US dollars. So if, you wanna, if anyone can uh, give me a few quid towards my work. So um, I'll explain to you why I wanted to pick up video from the space station. One of my hobbies is picking up video. But, uh, but uh, I found out the space station was going to start broadcasting video. If I can hit the right button. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Peake and welcome aboard the International Space Station, where we're orbiting Earth 16 times every day. One of the most rewarding activities that some astronauts undertake on orbit is to talk to schools using the space station's ham radio. Now these are events that are planned by ARIS, which is a worldwide group of amateur radio volunteers who are dedicated to introducing young people and students to science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Now this is the equipment here in the Columbus Laboratory, which consists of a handheld radio, a headset and we also have a ham video unit. Now as the International Space Station orbits above your location, a radio link is established between the ISS and your school. Now because we're traveling at nearly 18,000 miles per hour, which is an incredible 25 times the speed of sound, we usually get about nine or 10 minutes of good radio contact before losing the signal. So about five minutes before the scheduled start time of the contact, I come into the Columbus Laboratory and configure the radio so that I'm on the correct channel. And sometimes I'll set up a ham video too. Just before the predicted time, I begin to start calling the school using the standard amateur radio calling techniques. For example, if the call sign of your school was GB4FUN, I would say Golf Bravo 4, Foxtrot Uniform November, this is Golf Bravo 1 Sierra Sierra, listening and standing by. Now in your school, the radio operator will be listening for my call, but may also transmit and try to call me as well. You'll probably have a much more powerful transmitter on the ground than we have up here on board. So I'm likely to hear you before you hear me. Then, once we can hear each other, then comes the best bit, which is actually talking to the students and answering the questions. Once I've answered all the questions, we use the remaining time to say goodbye to each other and end the connection. I'll then spend a few minutes configuring the radio back into a rebroadcast mode and then I'll go back to my day job, which is, of course, doing science on board the International Space Station. ARIS is a brilliant opportunity for astronauts to talk to school pupils. It's really rewarding to hear how excited the students are when they're talking to somebody up here in space. And it's a true privilege to be able to inspire our next generation of scientists and engineers through amateur radio. So anyway, that video just explains what a school contact is. But I, I wasn't, I didn't even know much about that when I heard they were going to start broadcasting video. What I heard is they were going to put this box on the space station. So I see there's a power switch, a video camera switch, and there's a connection in the bottom right just for an aerial for outside. So I just wanted myself to try pick this up. So uh, being mean, I, um, I couldn't afford all the fancy equipment to pick it up. So uh, I went cheap and nasty, 
Um, I got a satellite dish that was sitting in a shed for years and was a bit bent. And um, you can see the high tech setup I have here. So you can see the bent corners of the satellite dish. Um, there's the, the grey bit in the middle is actually a bit of water pipe and there's a kind of a spring shaped thing inside. And I needed the point to set the space station. The problem is it was a cloudy day and you can't see the space station. So you can see the yellow thing I have there is the spirit level. So when the bubble is level, you know it's horizontal. And that one actually has a little digital display so you can tell which way to point it. I also had a sheet of paper on the ground with north, south, east and west. And I had a bit of a guess. I had a cable going from that into the car. And in the car I had a, a receiver for the receiving the video. And then I hooked it into the audio of my car and I went boop, 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 boop when the signal got stronger. And that was what I was doing. So this was the first time they ever broadcast video. And we got some video. So after I sent the video to the guys who were doing it, they said, oh, we're, we're, you're the first person outside of the main group to do it. We're actually looking to have stations around Europe. Could you, if we give you the equipment, set up a station in Ireland to receive the video? So I said, oh yeah, no bother, till I uh, started investigating what I needed. So you need a good location where you can see the horizon. The further south, the better, because the space station doesn't come over Dublin, it goes over Cork. And, um, so anyway, I talked to some people at the National Space Centre then in Cork. They, the European Space Agency paid for some of the equipment, and uh, myself and Tom, and with the help of Dermot, who's here tonight, um, we brought all the equipment down in the trailer, threw it up on top of the gatehouse, that's the security hook there. There's a little motor on the bottom that turns the dish one way, and there's a motor up the top that turns the dish up and down. We have special software inside that tracks, it, it asks NASA when is the space station due, and it turns and tracks the signal. So that sounds great, getting a signal from space, but what do you actually get? So this is an example of what we get. So you have all these settings, which basically you set them to what you're told to set them to. You hope the lights at the bottom go from red to green, which they have in that picture anyway. If they don't go green, it means your dish is probably pointed the wrong way, which does happen at times. And you get a video like this. So um, what we do in Cork is we receive the video from the space station, and then we send it directly to wherever the school is. Now the school may have a video system at the school, or they may not. But there's a station in Ireland, in France, in Italy, a couple in Italy and in Poland at the moment. And what we do is, as the space station is coming over Ireland, oh there's one in Portugal as well, either Ireland or Portugal will get it first, we'll send the video to the school, and then France will probably get it next, then Italy will get it next, and maybe Poland will get it last. So between three or four or five stations, we can get maybe 10 to 20 minutes of video. So the idea is when the school kids are talking to the astronaut, not only can they talk to the astronaut, they can also see the astronaut. And this was never available up until um, a year or two ago for these school contacts. So this gives you an idea, these are the different stations around Europe, and you see some of them have a picture, some of them don't have a picture, some of them have a picture but it's frozen because the space station has gone past them. So oh, usually the picture just freezes when you've lost the signal. So I'll show you this last video which gives you an idea of a school contact. Now it's actually been quite edited. What's up, this is John Breyer, KHTJ. Hang on, I'll just pause this. So it's actually been quite edited. Um, what we did is we added in, um, we added in the school's video and we added in um, the different videos synced together. Because normally what I record is just what the astronaut sees. You don't see any school children. So we wanted to combine it to a more interesting video. So I think 1 minute 20 in is where the good bit starts. So that's clear enough. So this is the school calling the space station. At the start they get audio, and then later on they get audio and video. I anybody if you ask question. Tell me, 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 tell me
Hope you were on TV. Give us a wave. Here's your next question. Hi, this is Sophie. What experiment would you like to add to your mission based on the experiences you have had? Over. Hi, Sophie. Um, I would like to see us doing more of the medical research, um, you know, investigating some more vaccines and looking into uh, new drug methods as well. I think that's some of the most exciting research we're doing up here. Over. Hi, this is Max. In what ways does the lack of natural sunlight and fresh air affect you on the ISS? Over. Hi Max, I love opening the windows in the cupola when I'm in uh, Node 3 or in the uh, Japanese module. I love the sunshine coming through the windows and it does make a difference. It does kind of brighten up your day and make you feel better. And you just get used to the fact that we see so many day and night cycles. Over. Hi, this is Charlotte. How do you get changed in space when your clothes go everywhere? Over. Hi Charlotte, they do go everywhere. We have to use bungees. Uh, we bungee our clothes down so they don't float off and you don't lose them. Over. Hi, this is Eden. One of the experiments you are conducting in space is to measure fluid shifts in the body. In what way does this help us back on Earth? Over. Hi Eden, that's a great question. Fluid shift really kicks off the whole process of the changes to our body. It's because of the fluid shift we get greater pressure in our head and we start to lose uh, bone density as well. So that triggers all the changes and it's by changing things in our body that we can learn about our body and we can investigate these things. Over. Hi, this is Thomas. With the basic design of current spacecraft dating back decades, where do you think the next leap forward in spacecraft technology will occur? Over. Hi Thomas, yes, I mean we're playing with the basic rules of physics and gravity here and laws of motion, so um, I think that we're going to see big changes to our spacecraft in terms of our transit to Mars and transit to Moon. Uh, but in terms of getting to low Earth orbit, I don't think we're going to see many big changes that, that we have in current spacecraft design ever. Hi, this is Emily. How different was the, was the training compared to the experience of actually launching into space? Over. I believe the training was so good that it really prepared us for launching into space and there are very few differences between what we were training for on ground and how we live and work up here in space. Over. Hi, this is Millie. With improving technology on Earth, are there experiments that you are currently carrying out in space that could one day be repeated on Earth? Over. <coughs> Yes, there are loads of experiments up here that we're doing that could be repeated uh, on Earth. I think that it's going to be a long time before we um, manage to sort of counter gravity for a long period of time on Earth. So we use parabolic flights and drop towers. But the benefit of being up here in low Earth orbit is, of course, we have microgravity continuously. So we can do those experiments for a very long time. Uh, but we do repeat the experiments back on Earth, of course, to see the changes, to see what's difference between space and Earth. Over. Hi, this is Erin. Which materials being developed with the electromagnetic levitator will have the largest impact on the development of greener living? Over. Hi Erin. Well, I think the metal alloys are the one area of research that are going to have the big impact on greener living uh, because that will affect how our engines are designed um, and uh, in particular our commercial aircraft turbine blades and turbine engines, for example, which will cut down fuel production and cut down fuel usage and uh, have a good impact in, in aviation. Over. Hi, this is Maddie asking Noah's question. Since being in space, what has been your most amusing dream? Over. Hi Maddy, do you know I, I haven't dreamt much up here in space uh, and when I do I dream of Earth, I haven't yet dreamt of being in space um, and I think it's because we, we sleep quite heavily up here actually, I, quite, I sleep quite well here in space, over. Hi, this is Austin asking Livy's question. If everyone in Britain turned their lights on and off at the same time, would you hear from space, over. Hi Austin, yes, you definitely would see it. You know, we would see a, a small village if you turned your lights on and off. It's amazing that um, we, the lights really stand out very well from space. Um, and certainly a, a major city turning their lights on and off would stand out very clearly. Over. Hi, this is Sophie asking Ella's question. Which part of the Earth do you like orbiting over the most and why? Over. Hi Sophie, uh, I love orbiting over Africa, it just looks beautiful from space, it's like flying over a, a canvas of art, 
Um, and also north, northern Canada is beautiful, especially right now with all the ice and the, uh, even the sea is frozen up there. Over. Hi, this is Max asking Amy's question. With sunrise and sunset occurring 16 times a day on board the ISS, does it have any noticeable effect on your blood clock? Over. I, Max, that's a great question. Yes, it does. You know, if, I, if I'm looking in the cupola late at night when it's bright sunshine, it does take me a while to get to sleep, uh, so I try not to do that. You have to kind of try and trick your body that it's night time when it's time to go to sleep. Over. Hi, this is Charlotte asking Mimi's question. How does being in space make you relate to your place in the universe? Over. Hi Charlotte, that's a great question. You know, I mean, being up in space gives a different perspective and it makes you realise how vast the solar system is, how vast the universe is, and also it makes you realise that our planet, uh, you know, it has no borders, it's got massive weather systems that uh, are affect all continents, and so it does give you that perspective of, of the planet as a whole. Over. Hi, this is Eden asking Bruno's question. Is there a song or a piece of art that you think reproduces the feeling of being in zero gravity? If so, which one? Over. Hi Eden, well, I, if nothing particular comes to mind, but you know some of those pictures where things look uh, different upside down, for example, it might be a beautiful woman one way up and a, an old haggard woman one, the other way up. I think that's great because it, it makes you realise in space, of course, we have a different perspective depending on which way up we are. Over. The G, B, 2, C and S for turning. That was fantastic, thank you. Everyone here would like to say a big thank you. So uh, that gives you an idea of a school contact. So I, I helped out with some of the UK school contacts. Um, I'll see if I can find the video. Um, so I helped out with some of the UK school contacts and um, I'm looking to try to organise some in Ireland. So we're hoping to have one uh, with Dublin school children and Cork school children maybe um, later in the year. And we don't know if we'll get video with it. The video system is very new and it's not always used and it's quite difficult to organise, but we're hoping to at least have voice, and we're hoping to at least have a few silly questions as well. So um, we've applied, but um, there's going to be French astronauts on board the space station for the next uh, few months, so they're trying to give priority for the French astronauts to talk to French students in French. So um, that's what's going on at the moment. So that's the kind of projects I've been working with. Um, if you have any technical questions, I can answer them afterwards. Um, as I was saying, after the main talk, we'll give a tour of the space. We'll explain a bit about the space, um, how we're non-for-profit, and we don't get any grants, and we just um, we um, pay for the place ourselves. Most events we do here are all free and open. And uh, as I was saying, after Mark finishes his talk, um, we'll give a quick tour. So I'll turn the light for a minute, um, so uh, it doesn't fall on his face. 